Halo testing has been a hot topic lately. Apparently, it doesn't cause hypothalamic pituitary testicular axis suppression and isn't toxic to the liver at all. And scientific evidence seems to support that, albeit not entirely. Join me as we analyze all of the studies, mix in a healthy amount of bro science, and combine all of that with 10 plus years of blood work results from Halo testing abusing athletes, so we can all make sense of this debacle as soon as possible, right after your favorite epilepsy inducing disclaimer. Vigor Steve here, joking aside, Ty and Clark was 100% onto something when he told us on the Vigor's podcast that halotestin, fluoxymestrolone, isn't HPTA suppressive and isn't toxic to the liver. And without his claims, I wouldn't have dived into the scientific literature as deep as I did for the last couple of weeks in order to make this video. And a big shout out to Dorian Belly, who works over at Merrick Health for sending me a boatload of studies revolving around halotestin and its effect on the HPTA. And thanks to all of you guys for sending me studies over the last couple of weeks showing various effects of halotestin ever since I had at Tay and Clark on the podcast. So I really hope you guys watch this fluoxymestrolone deep dive all the way to the end and leave a like and a comment while you're at it. Share it with a halo testing abusing or loving best friend because I need a little bit of return of investment of all of the time that is spent on PubMed, Science Direct, Google Scholar, ResearchGate, etc. So hold on to your bottle of pharmacy and upjohn halo testing. Grab yourself some L-theanine, glycine and saffron extract. This is the best fluoxymestrolone deep dive you'll find anywhere in the internet and you're in for a wild ride going forward. Fluoxymestrolone almost has a cult-like status for making you look dense and hard at the end of a contest prep, finishing your look off to the point you look like a marble statue with granite features, assuming you're lean enough, let's say below 6% body fat, but ideally 4% body fat. Fluoxymestrolone also makes you strong as even in a severely caloric or restrictive state at the end of a contest prep. But if you eat a Hoftor Bjornsson mountain of food, see what I did there, then it really makes you strong. And be forewarned, fluoxymestrolone is known to make you mad angry even within the first day of using it. Basically, it'll give you trend rage on steroids, which is already roid rage on steroids. Now, spoiler alert, I still don't think that fluoxymestrolone is suitable as an oral only cycle, just like any other anabolic steroid or selective androgen receptor modulator, even though fluoxymestrolone halotestin is prescribed in cases of androgen deficiency as a replacement therapy, and it even has been shown to improve fertility parameters in subfertile men. So let's jump right into the medical insert and see what we can learn from this little paper leaflet that usually goes straight into the trash bin. I've linked the latest 2006 version of the halotestin insert down below in the YouTube description section, but I digested it in an easy to understand list, which is on the screen right now. And the medical applications of halotestin are as follows. In cases of androgen deficiency and primary hypogonadism, the dose is between 5 milligrams to 20 milligrams orally daily over two to four divided dosages. In case of delayed puberty, the dosages increases over the course of four to six months, but it highly depends on the primary healthcare physician who prescribes halotestin in this context. In the treatment of advanced and inoperable breast cancer in women, it might be anywhere between 10 milligrams to 40 milligrams orally daily over two to four divided dosages. And this is often combined with tamoxifen, better known as Nolvidex. As a fertility medication, again, this treatment has been long since discontinued, but we'll get to that. Um, the dosages range between two milligrams up to 30 milligrams orally daily for up to one and a half years after which fertility parameters and overall pregnancy outcomes improved significantly, again, only in subfertile men. And during all of my research, I also found out that halotestin was prescribed for the prevention of postpartum breast pain and engorgement in non-breastfeeding mothers, and also in the treatment of uterine hemorrhage, dysmenorrhea, and postmenopausal syndrome, but I couldn't find the exact treatment dosing protocol. Now, if you scroll through the medical insert, the manufacturers specifically mention that the prolonged use of higher dosages of androgens, specifically 17-alpha alkylated oral androgen therapy, have been associated with the development of hepatic adenomas, hepatocellular carcinomas, and peliosis hepatitis, which the scientific evidence does support. And these are all potentially life-threatening complications of using oral steroids 
long term. And if cholestatic hepatitis or jaundice occurs during fluoxymestrolone treatment, then the treatment should be discontinued immediately. And this cholestatic hepatitis or jaundice is completely reversible with time. And the manufacturers also note that because of the hepatotoxicity associated with 17-alpha alkylated oral androgens, that liver function tests should be performed periodically. So it's, I'm not the only one who says that. The manufacturer also tells you to do that. So don't procrastinate. When you take oral steroids or oral SARMs as monotherapy or alongside your injectable testosterone base, do some freaking blood work. Please, everybody is telling you to do it. And they also warn right there in the insert that the administration of exogenous androgens will suppress endogenous testosterone production through a negative feedback by suppressing luteinizing hormone secretion. And it could even affect spermatogenesis downstream by having a negative effect on follicle stimulating hormone levels as well. So the medical insert tells you to be wary of liver toxicity and impaired fertility parameters, but the scientific evidence tells a different story. This is very conflicting, right? So still proceed with caution, but let's dive into the scientific evidence and see what the evidence-based unique characteristics of fluoxymestrone halotestin actually are compared to all of the other anabolic androgenic steroids that are the market and seem also appealing, maybe even more appealing than halotestin itself. And as always, all citations are down below in the top pinned comments, unless YouTube turns the comment section off again. And then I swear, since halotestin apparently is not suppressive on the HPTA, I'm gonna take a single dose of 30 milligrams and yell at the AI of the YouTube creator support and tear that bot a new Okay, let's get started with the unique characteristics. Unlike most oral steroids, fluoxymestrolone is not a dihydro testosterone derivative or 19 nor testosterone derivative. Fluoxymestrolone is a direct testosterone derivative and a substrate for the 5 alpha reductase enzymes, where it converts into 5 alpha dihydrofluoxymestrolone, which is considered an active metabolite which has also been investigated as a potential breast cancer medication, but I couldn't find a single publication which actually investigated the effects of 5-alpha dihydrofluoxymestrone in the context of breast cancer. It also increases hematocrit and red blood cell count in aplastic anemia, increases bone mineralization stemming from animal models. Fluoxymestrone might offer clinical application in prostate and breast cancers in humans, where it often combines with tamoxifen, Nolvidex, again, that's in breast cancer, in prostate cancer, it's combined with other medications. Fluoxymestrone decreased a level of thyroxine requirement in women with hypothyroidism, that's a human study. It increases height velocity in adolescent boys and girls with stunted growth. And during these studies, no adverse effects were observed. We'll get into that. And is sometimes combined with exogenous growth hormone. And uniquely among all anabolic androgenic steroids, fluoxymestrolone is a very potent inhibitor of the 11-beta-hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase type 2 enzymes, which is most likely due to its 11-beta-hydroxyl group. And it's this 11-beta-hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase type 2 enzymes, which would otherwise inactivate glucocorticoids cortisol into cortisone and corticosterone into 11-dehydrocorticosterone, which are both biologically benign, preventing the breakdown of these glucocorticoids might result in mineral corticoid receptor overstimulation, resulting in fluid retention and a severe increase in blood pressure. And you might have noticed that if you do a contest prep, even if your body fat levels are super low and you got your blood pressure under control, you add the halotestin in and your blood pressure goes up or you do a strongman or powerlifting competition, you add in the halotestin, and now the nosebleeds are basically from both holes, and you start bleeding from your ears and your eyes as well, doing PRs on deadlift. So a little bit of caution is advised. And what makes it even worse, unlike other steroids, fluoxymestrolone has structural similarities to corticosteroids and is known to block the glucocorticoid receptors as well. So not only does fluoxymestrone prevent the breakdown of glucocorticoids, it also blocks the receptor site and thus serum cortisol levels might reach very unhealthy levels. Now, keep in mind that exogenous testosterone has a suppressive effect on cortisol secretion. And the root extract has a suppressive effect on cortisol secretion. And imodin is also known to reduce cortisol levels. It's not entirely known if exogenous testosterone and the root extract plus imodin is enough to offset this cortisol increase that halotestin 
potentiates. And for your information, Emodin is a 11-beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type 1 enzyme inhibitor, which would otherwise convert cortisone into cortisol and 11-dehydrocorticosterone into corticosterone. So now we have halotestin to inhibit the type 2 enzymes and emodin to inhibit the type 1 enzymes. And you might end up at a net even with perfectly balanced glucocorticoids and no overstimulation of the mineral corticoid receptor, right? Um, I haven't talked to anybody who has done this specific combination. So if you've tried this, let us know your experiences down below, assuming that YouTube didn't turn off the comment section. Otherwise, you should check back in a couple hours. Fluoxymesterone apparently has clastogenic potential shown in chromosome aberrations in cultured human lymphocyte cells and mice bone marrow cells, again, from in vitro studies. And it basically means that fluoxymesterone can mutate the DNA and the chromosomes. Citations are down below in case you're interested. Fluoxymesterone inhibits thymus growth in animal models. So if you're um, taking growth hormone to grow your thymus, then don't combine that with halotestin. Otherwise, you may be at a net even. Um, and this potentially can compromise the immune system because you need the thymus for immune function. Fluoxymesterone increases mitochondrial outer carnitine palmitol transferase activity, but it's in the liver only, not observed in heart or skeletal muscle. So um, some overlap regarding fat oxidation might not entirely be there. Apparently, fluoxymesterone doesn't fully suppress the HBTA in human subjects. Um, there is, appears to be a 40 to 49% reduction of luteinizing hormone and a minimal reduction in follicle-stimulating hormone levels. Don't worry, we'll get into all of the scientific evidence a little bit later. And as you guys might have remembered from the steroids versus fertility video, which I dropped a couple months ago, apparently fluoxymesterone improves fertility in infertile and subfertile men, where the treatment dosages range between 2 milligrams up to 30 milligrams daily for as long as one and a half years. Now, all of these studies have been performed, nine studies performed between 1972 to 1987, Total sample size of 224 men among all of these studies where fertility parameters improved following fluoxymesterone treatments. Um, but I feel that follicle stimulating hormone or human chorionic gonadotropin are far superior treatment methods for infertility nowadays, right? Back then, we didn't have recombinant human chorionic gonadotropin or follicle stimulating hormone available. Clomid was available, but uh, based on the scientific literature, I would not run that for longer periods of time. It appears that 220 milligrams zinc sulfate supplementation twice daily further enhances fertility parameters alongside fluoxymesterone. Again, this is an old study, so I would use zinc glycate or bisglycinate nowadays at a far lower dose of, let's say, 25 milligrams zinc per day alongside of the zinc that you're getting from your diet. But I also have to mention that there's five human studies where fluoxymesterone did not improve fertility parameters in subfertile men or even had a negative outcome because fertility parameters worsened even more, right? So that's nine studies showing a positive result and five studies showing a neutral result or a negative result, right? You have to take the meta-analysis for what it is. Don't say that fluoxymesterone is a great fertility aid because let's say one third of the studies showed that it had a negative outcome or no improvement altogether. Based on the human studies and animal models, I would say that fluoxymesterone has minimal hepatotoxicity, a couple case studies aside. Pulling everything together, it has a slight increase or reduction in liver enzymes and a slight increase in lactose dehydrogenase, alkaline phosphatase, and total and direct bilirubin levels. Unfortunately, there's not so many studies that we can pull from, but we'll get into the details a little bit later on. And apparently, fluoxymesterone protects against phalloidin-induced peliosis hepatic liver lesions in animal models. Phalloidin is a mushroom cytotoxin, so it might have some protective effects if you're exposing yourself to mushroom toxicity. All right, next are the clinical trials, but unfortunately, most of the clinical trials that investigate fluoxymesterone did not really keep track of the adverse effects. Right, they're mentioned here and there, but I reviewed all of the clinical trials, which were too many. I right, have PTSD from all the clinical trials that are reviewed regarding fluoxymesterone. Uh, they merely investigated if breast cancer went into remission and improved the outcome of lifespan, or they looked into the high velocity in Turner syndrome, or prostatic response in instances of benign prostate enlargement or prostate cancer. So here's a summary of all of the clinical trials. So I have a little bit of an overview. 
uh, but we're not going to go too in depth because we're after the safety and efficacy. And um, with the clinical trials, the safety isn't really established. So the fluxomestrone clinical trials summary is as follows. The sample size are either elderly or postmenopausal or both adult women, elderly adult men, and adolescent girls. And the investigated diseases are metastatic breast cancers to offset cancer-induced anorexia or cachexia, myelodyspastic syndromes, which is a group of cancers in which blood cells don't mature in the bone marrow, myeloma, a condition where blood cells grow too large within the bone marrow, benign prostate enlargement, prostate cancer, and Turner syndrome. Treatment dosages were either 1.25 milligrams, 2.5 milligrams, 4 milligrams, 10 milligrams, 20 milligrams, 30 milligrams, and 60 milligrams daily. Treatment duration was either three days. A lot of the scientific evidence is only three to four days. Um, two weeks, one month, three months, six months, one year, and even two years. And it appears that a low dose for a short duration of time in cases of benign prostate enlargement or prostate cancer or long duration in cases of Turner syndrome caused no adverse effects. Again, scientific evidence somewhat thin, but a high dose long-term duration fluoxymestrone treatment in cases of breast cancer alongside tamoxifen or other therapies resulted in severe adverse effects whenever reported. But in many cases, the adverse effects are simply not reported. Co-administration of other medications includes uh, chemotherapy, 10 to 20 milligrams tamoxifen, and a couple of medications with unpronounceable names, so I'm not even going to try. These were all used in breast cancer scenarios. 1,000 milligrams amino glutathamide daily or 40 milligrams hydrocortisone daily. This is in cases of prostate issues. 0.5 milligrams to 1 milligrams estradiol valerate daily, uh, sometimes in combination up to 4 I use growth hormone daily for Turner syndrome, right, alongside fluoxymestrolone treatment. So in many cases, the clinical trials did not just investigate fluoxymestrolone solo, it's in combination with other medications. And here are the listed complications, including osteolytic bone lesions, hot flashes, deepening of the voice, Hirstuism, dermatitis, edema, mood disturbances, meal pattern baldness, even though some studies mention that no hair loss was observed, increased prostate serum markers, nausea, headache, lethargy, spinal cord compression, intolerable pain, and increased or decreased libido. And obviously these are mostly considered to be androgenic side effects, albeit that blood pressure increases or severe changes to total cholesterol and other lipid parameters were apparently not measured or not observed, right? I went through all of it, but regarding side effects, the evidence and the scientific literature quite thin. Now, the big question of this video obviously is, does fluoxymestrolone suppress the hypothalamic pituitary testicular axis? And can you actually run a halo test in oral only cycle while keeping luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone in range, testosterone levels in range, and fertility parameters intact? And pulling all of the scientific evidence together, I'm going to have to say yes. Right? There's no 100% suppression of luteinizing hormone and total testosterone, and follicle stimulating hormone seems to remain unaffected, which could explain why fertility parameters actually improve in subfertile men. Still, there are instances of bottomed out luteinizing hormone and total testosterone levels, so we have to go through all of the scientific literature to make a fair point, because most of the scientific literature, like I mentioned before, is either three days, four days, or as little as a week, you can't really base your HPTA assumptions on such a short treatment duration. Keep in mind that all of the scientific evidence is extremely old. Very, very, very old, right? We're in 2024 now, and this goes as far as the early 2000s. So please still take it all with a grain of salt. For this HPTA literature review, I did not include pseudo-hermaphrodite studies, stunted growth in children studies, Female studies is that her hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis is reasonably dynamic. Dexamethasone studies, medroxyprogesterone acetate studies, uh, case studies of unhealthy men, and I didn't include animal models, right? We're solely focusing on healthy men and see how fluoxymestrone treatment affects their HPTA. Let's first look at a combination treatment of clomiphene plus fluoxymestrone to see if the HPTA, luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, total testosterone levels 
remain sustained when you use the selective estrogen receptor modulator to block the estrogen receptors in the hypothalamus and the pituitary and keep HPTA going when you use an exogenous androgen. In this study, three men, not an entirely large sample size, but this is the best we can do. Three men received 50 to 80 milligrams fluoxymesterone daily for 10 days. After three days, they received 200 milligrams clomiphene citrate daily alongside fluoxymesterone. After seven days of combination treatment, serum LH and FSH levels did not recover anywhere close to baseline and maintained suppressed to comparable levels when clomiphene was added. But LH and FSH were not completely bottomed out after 10 days. So maybe there's some hope. And those results are further confirmed in this study with a sample size of two men. So that's a total sample size of five men. That's the best I can do. That's all there is. These two healthy men received also 200 milligrams clomiphene plus five milligrams fluoxymesterone every six hours. So that's a total of 20 milligrams per day, significantly less than the previous study. But the clomiphene dose is exactly the same uh, for 10 consecutive days also. Luteinizing hormone dropped below the normal healthy range by day three. So that's in combination with clomiphene and remained there until the treatment was completed. So, so much for running a selective estrogen receptor modulator alongside fluoxymesterone to keep LH and FSH levels intact. Even though the sample size is five, it's still tangible evidence. So what about running human chorionic gonadotropin alongside fluoxymesterone treatment? Then Steve. Well, unfortunately, it hasn't been directly investigated, but there are several stimulation and suppression studies out there, which we can pull data from, where they investigated the effects on serum testosterone levels following HCG stimulation and fluoxymesterone suppression. This is the best study that I was able to find on the subject in healthy men, but there are several stimulation and suppression studies out there in case studies or otherwise unhealthy men. So we'll use this one going forward. The results are pretty much the same. This study performed by Perk et al. titles Plasma Dihydrotestosterone in Normal Adult Males and Its Relation to Testosterone, where they took 12 healthy men aged 21 to 30 years old. They received 5,000 IOs HCG intramuscularly for three consecutive days, after which serum testosterone and dihydrotestosterone levels were significantly elevated. After the stimulation test, men received 20 milligrams of fluoxymesterone twice daily, so that's 40 milligrams in total, for three consecutive days, after which serum testosterone and dihydrotestosterone testosterone levels were significantly decreased and much lower compared to baseline. But I would say that these results are kind of inconclusive because nobody does this kind of protocol, run ATG first and then followed by an androgen. We usually run ATG alongside our hormone replacement therapy. And if you were to go, if you were crazy enough to do a halo test and oral only cycle for androgen deficiency or androgen replacement, I would say that ATG alongside this practice at let's say 250 IOs to 500 IOs three times per week. And this is far lower than the investigated dosages in the ATG stimulation studies. I would say that a low dose goes a very long way to sustain testicular function. And in the upcoming studies, which we're going to address, you see that luteinizing hormone levels decline between 40 to 49%. So maybe a low dose of HCG can sustain testicular function after total testosterone and luteinizing hormone levels have come down to um, subclinical levels. Starting with the study performed by Swerdlov et al. published on September 21st, 1968. They were starting right way back in the good old days, titled Feedback Control of Male Gonadotropin Secretion. In the study, they took nine healthy men between 18 to 31 years old with normal testicular function. They received either 10 milligrams or 25 milligrams of fluoxymesterone twice daily. So that's a total dose of either 20 milligrams or 50 milligrams for four consecutive days. In six out of nine men, serum luteinizing hormone levels dropped to undetectable levels in the high dose 50 milligram fluoxymesterone group after four days of treatment. So that's the end of the investigation. And the researchers noted that only luteinizing hormone seems to be affected by fluoxymesterone, but not follicle stimulating hormone. Moving over to the next study performed by Ditlov et al. published on May 1970 titled Failure of Follicle Stimulating Hormone Release by Oxytocin in Men, where two healthy men received 40 milligrams of fluoxymesterone plus two IUs oxytocin for the guys who remember my libido videos 
oxytocin for libido, I mean, that's next level. So they received this combination for three consecutive days, also a very short time window, after which luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone were comparable to baseline. So maybe it's the oxytocin that can keep luteinizing hormone levels within normal parameters, unlike the previous study. Now, don't worry, we have many more studies to cover. So let's move on to this one. Uh, performed by Ruder et al., published on September 1971, titled Effects of Induced Hyperthyroidism on Steroid Metabolism in Men, where they took three young men aged between 21 to 25 years old. Um, they received 60 milligrams fluoxymestron daily for four days, also a very short window of time, after which plasma luteinizing hormone and total testosterone levels decreased in two out of three subjects. In the third subject, serum testosterone levels were higher, but the researchers speculated that this might be a lab error. So let me get this correctly. Three days on halo testing, no suppression, but four days on halo, that's already a reduction in LH and total testosterone levels. What about five days on halo? Well, this study investigates just that, performed by Krishner et al., published in June 1972, titled Suppression of Androgen and Estrogen Production in Normal Men. In this study, men received 40 mg fluoxymestrolone for five days, after which serum testosterone levels dropped by 85% and urinary luteinizing hormone dropped by 40% and urinary estrogens also decreased. But the researchers did note that full suppression did not occur within those five days of treatment. But again, that's only five days and who takes halotestin for five days? Unless you're an MMA fighter who takes halotestin for a couple days leading into the fight. Okay, moving over to the next study performed by Hendry et al. published in December 1973, titled Investigation and Treatment of the Subfertile Male where they took 20 healthy men with normal sperm count, uh, but poor motility, probably oxidative stress. They received 5 mg fluoxymestrone daily for three to six months. 13 men, which is 65% of the cases, motility improved. And over the course of the treatment, three pregnancies occurred. So that's 15% of the cases. Fluoxymestrone is good for pregnancies, it appears. Uh, serum testosterone was 41% lower compared to the control group in the men who observed an improvement in semen parameters. So that means total testosterone levels come down, but because of fluoxymestrolone treatment, semen parameters and motility improves altogether, which is a very interesting outcome. But in the men with no semen parameter improvements, serum testosterone levels increased by 9%. So maybe testosterone is the reason for infertility, and if you bring testosterone levels up, a fertility parameter certainly don't improve. Isn't that, doesn't that sound very familiar? Where we take exogenous testosterone and our fertility parameters don't get any better? Well, food for thought. Uh, urinary luteinizing hormone levels increased in all men between 17 to 36% compared to control group. Is that because total testosterone levels went down and thus serum estradiol levels went down and there's no negative suppressive effect on the hypothalamic pituitary testicular axis? Very, very likely, very interesting outcomes. Let's move over to the next study performed by Vigorsky et al, uh, published on July 1976, titled Effects of Fluoxymestrolone on the Pituitary Gonadal Axis a role of testosterone estradiol binding globulin, where they took four healthy men between 20 to 22 years old. Again, it's all very young men in these fluoxymestrolone studies. Um, welcome to 1976. Uh, they received 10 milligrams fluoxymestrolone every six hours, so that's 40 milligrams total daily for three consecutive days, also another very short duration study. Serum luteinizing hormone levels was 94% lower compared to control and total testosterone levels were 72% lower compared to the control groups. And just like the previous short duration fluoxymestrolone treatment studies, after three days, serum luteinizing hormone and total testosterone levels were not fully suppressed. But we have to go with long-term duration studies. Again, in the previous study, total testosterone levels were within the clinically accepted reference range between 330 to 615 nanograms per deciliter. All right, next one, performed by Jones et al., published on January 1977, titled The Effects of Fluoxymestrolone Administration on Testicular Function, 
uh, where they took nine healthy men aged between 22 to 30 years old. They received either 10 milligrams, 20 milligrams, or 30 milligrams fluoxymestrone daily for 12 weeks, longer periods of time. After the treatment, semen parameters remained unaffected, but worsened after fluoxymestrone was discontinued. Interesting. Now, keep in mind that semen parameters, semen formation, spermatogenesis in the testicles, takes up to 78 days, and then it needs to transport, swim, literally, to the seminal vesicles of the prostate, which might take another 11 days. So it takes about 90 days for semen to mature and be ready for ejaculation, after which you can measure it uh, through a semen analysis. So maybe all the sperm that was produced was during fluoxymestrolone treatment, and that's why they worsened after this was investigated when the fluoxymestrolone was discontinued. Now, these nine healthy men were not subfertile. They had normal fertility parameters at the start of the treatment. Again, in subfertile men, fluoxymestrolone might improve semen parameters due to an increase of overall androgen levels. Serum testosterone levels were significantly lower in these nine healthy men, albeit that there was no dose-dependent suppressive effect observed during the treatment. Levels returned to normal after the treatment was discontinued which could be because the luteinizing hormone levels are not fully suppressed, and after you discontinue the fluoxymestrolone, luteinizing hormone levels just come back down to baseline, and then testosterone levels downstream obviously increase also. And the researchers also noted that the reduction in serum testosterone levels are not accompanied by a reduction or worsening of spermatogenesis, but it's probably because the study was so short, like I mentioned earlier, or because follicle-stimulating hormone remains close to baseline after 12 weeks compared to the start of the study. All right, so there's a little bit of food for thought there. Um, at least none of the subjects experienced libido issues, gynecomastia, or alterations in hair pattern. Now, just because we see a little text here that it's supposedly hair safe, doesn't mean that fluoxymestrolone halotestin is completely hair safe because it's not really been investigated in any of the studies that I was able to find. And similar to the previous short duration studies, serum luteinizing hormone saw a significant decline initially, but in this study, it appeared to recover during the treatment and raised beyond baseline levels compared to at the start of the study. Right? Total testosterone levels come down, serum estradiol levels come down, no negative suppressive effect on follicle stimulating hormone secretion or luteinizing hormone secretion in the pituitary and the hypothalamus. And thus, uh, LH levels go up higher than at the start of the study while follicle stimulating hormone levels remain comparable to baseline. <laughs> Isn't that cool? <laughs> Isn't that freaking cool, right? Tyne was onto something, guys, I'm telling you. All right, and this is probably why serum testosterone levels improve so dramatically after fluoxymestrolone treatment is discontinued because the luteinizing hormone levels are already elevated. Now, if fluoxymestrolone suppresses testosterone production in the testicles, but luteinizing hormone levels are high and follicle stimulating levels are comparable to baseline, then obviously, as soon as you take the halotestin out, testosterone is allowed to be produced within the testicles. Yet again, keep in mind that there's a direct suppressive effect within the testicles because the testicles have androgen receptors and estrogen receptors and progesterone receptors also. All right, so you take the halo out, testosterone levels come right back up. All right, let's start pulling all of this interesting data together for the ultimate fluoxymestrolone treatment in men meta-analysis. With a total sample size of over 47 healthy men, could be more, but one of the studies isn't available as a full publication, and the total sample size is unfortunately unknown. Treatment dosages range between 5 milligrams to 60 milligrams total daily, with a treatment duration of anywhere between 3 days up to 6 months. Most of the studies which we investigated were a very short period of time, 3 days, 4 days, 5 days, 2 studies of 12 weeks, and then one study of 6 months. But if you look into the fertility studies, the fertility treatments of fluoxymestrolone might last up to 1.5 years. And the results are as follows. Total testosterone, a reduction between 41 to 85% and full suppression in, uh, to subclinical levels in some cases, but a rapid recovery post-treatment. Luteinizing hormone, a reduction between 40% up to 49%. Again, full suppression to subclinical levels in some cases. Uh, there might also be cases of a 9% increase and 17 to 36% increase in in urinary luteinizing hormone levels with a rapid recovery post-treatment. 
and you might be able to say that too, I use oxytocin alongside fluoxymestrolone treatment, might, 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 based on the sample size of two men, I might be able to keep the luteinizing hormone levels at baseline, uh, but don't take that too seriously. Take that with all of the salt you can find in the cupboard. And when it comes to follicle stimulating hormone, even though there's a slight reduction in serum levels, they are comparable to baseline and recover just as well after fluoxymestrolone has been discontinued. Now, based on all of the scientific evidence, and it's a good amount, it's certainly more studies compared to oxandrolone anivar, which shows that there's a, a suppressive effect on luteinizing hormone and total testosterone levels, but those are still within the clinically accepted reference ranges again two studies versus the many which we just highlighted and that's only in healthy men there's many more in unhealthy men and animal models um i would say that fluoxymestrolone is reasonably hpta safe but i haven't reviewed proviron which is also known to improve fertility parameters and might keep luteinizing hormone total testosterone and follicle stimulating hormone levels in range at lower dosages which i've seen in blood work results of many a, um, a client over the years where they take 6.25 milligrams per viral either once or twice per day as monotherapy to bring their SHBG levels down and LH, FSH and total testosterone is completely unaffected. But stay tuned for a literature review. I still have to do all of the other oral anabolic antigenic steroids as part of this very lengthy best dose deep dive. Uh, but when we're done with that, I can start comparing and see which oral steroid is actually the most HPTA safe. For now, I would say that halotestin is going to be a good candidate. And there's actually a few more studies performed in either unhealthy men or men with an already impaired HPTA, hypogonadal testicles removed, that kind of stuff. And the results are actually very similar to the studies we already discussed. Total testosterone and luteinizing hormone see a significant reduction in serum parameters, even follicle stimulating hormone levels come down and a somewhat suppressed estradiol level depending on the length of the study. Now we're already 30 minutes into this video, so if you want to do additional research, the citations are down below, otherwise this video is going to be three and a half hours. But there's one more study that I want to highlight because it has some practical applications and something we can learn from. We already went through the Clomid and HCG studies. There might be some practical application for a kickstart with ethanol estradiol at the start of fluoxymestrolone treatment if done solo. This study performed by Sawin et al. published on June 1978 titled Effects of Chronic Administrations of Estrogen, Androgen, or Both on Serum Levels of Gonadotropin in Adult Men. In this study, 10 healthy men aged 19 to 25 years old, also way too young to do an oral-only cycle. During the first week, they just assessed the blood work parameters to get a little bit of a baseline. Then in the second week of treatment, they received 50 micrograms oral ethanol estradiol daily. During the third week, they received 50 micrograms oral ethanol estradiol plus 20 milligrams fluoxymestrone daily. During the fourth week, they discontinued the ethanol estradiol and uh, reduced the fluoxymestrone to 10 milligrams daily. But then in the fifth week, they increased to 20 milligrams fluoxymestrone daily again. Seven out of 10 men completed the treatment. No adverse side effects were reported during the treatment. But again, most of these studies don't really go after the adverse effects of these kinds of treatments. To be fair, oral ethanol estradiol is suppressive on its own, right? We know this in the scientific literature, especially based on birth control studies. So after two weeks on 50 micrograms, serum follicle stimulating hormones were already significantly suppressed by 41% compared to baseline. Keep in mind that men also received 20 milligrams fluoxymestrone daily alongside the ethanol estradiol during the third week of treatment, which already resulted in a drop of 74% compared to baseline. So oral ethanol estradiol dropped it to 41% and then another 47% reduction after adding in the fluoxymestrone. After the ethanol estradiol was removed, serum follicle stimulating hormone levels returned to baseline within four days and remained comparable to baseline for the remainder of the one half weeks that fluoxymestrone was administered between 10 milligrams to 20 milligrams daily. Ethanol estradiol alone did not have a suppressive effect on serum luteinizing hormone levels, but the addition of 20 milligrams fluoxymestrone daily saw a significantly suppressed luteinizing hormone by 46% compared to baseline. However, luteinizing hormone returns back to baseline after stopping the oral ethanol estradiol, 
even when fluoxymestrone treatment was continued for another two weeks, between 10 to 20 milligrams daily. Ethanol estradiol also suppressed serum testosterone levels by 27% compared to baseline, and the combination of ethanol estradiol plus fluoxymestrone caused it all to fall to 57% compared to baseline, but after oral ethanol estradiol was discontinued, serum testosterone levels recovered almost back to baseline readings. So similarly to the previous study where men received either 10 mg, 20 mg or 30 mg of fluoxymestrone for 12 weeks in duration, in the beginning luteinizing hormone levels saw a significant decline, after which they ended up higher than baseline at the 12 week mark, but total testosterone levels were still significantly suppressed. In this study, within five weeks, total testosterone is back to baseline and luteinizing hormone as well and follicle stimulating hormone also. Because maybe oral ethanol estradiol is actually the secret ingredient to keep your HPTA intact in the long term and use that as a kickstart method to suppress your luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone and total testosterone levels, after which it comes back and stays sustained throughout the entire duration of fluoxymesterone treatment. If you want to reinvent the wheel and biohack, do it right. Okay, enough with the HPTA talk. What about the liver, bro? Is my liver going to melt and explode after I take halotestin? Let's get started with two rodent models where the rats were actually trained. So we have a little bit more oversight regarding liver enzymes because we also know that training can increase liver enzymes quite substantially and halotestin makes you train hard so there's a little bit of an overlap there in this study male western rats were trained five days per week for 12 consecutive weeks from week five onwards rats received either two milligrams per kilogram of body weight fluoxymesterone or methyl androstanolone also known as mestanolone or methyl testosterone through oral administration after the 12-week exercise program and eight-week fluoxymesterone or methyl dht treatment Rat, rats did not exercise for 36 to 44 hours to let liver enzymes come down a little bit because it's also increased from training as we all know and received the last dose 14 to 18 hours before they were sacrificed after which liver enzymes aspartate aminotransferase ast and alanine aminotransferase alt alkaline phosphatase alp total and direct bilirubin levels were analyzed. Interestingly, the researchers noted that neither training nor steroid treatment had a significant effect on serum liver enzymes, alkaline phosphatate levels or serum bilirubin levels, as they all remained within normal ranges. But that's not what I see, because when you look at the table, you see that both ALT and AST liver enzymes are lower, yes, that's right, lower in the trained and untrained fluoxymesterone groups compared to the sedentary controls and the mestanolone groups, albeit that alkaline phosphatates and total uh, bilirubin levels are increased in the fluoxymesterone group, while direct bilirubin is comparable amongst all groups. So based on a single study, if I were as bad as all of the other educators out there that quote single studies, take a little snippet of information and then form their entire conclusion based on that, if I were to do that, I could say that maybe we don't need Tutka at all. All you need to do is take some fluoxymesterone to bring those liver enzymes right back down. And if you were to calculate that to the human equivalent dose, that would be 32.4 milligrams for a 100 kilogram human being. Where do I sign up? And these results are actually confirmed in a comparable rodent study published in the exact same month on July 1993 where they performed similar running exercises and had a similar fluoxymestrolone dosing protocol. The researchers noted that exercise or steroid treatment or both did not have a significant effect on blood work parameters in both male and female mice. And we look at table two, in trained or untrained male mice, liver enzymes go down with fluoxymestrolone treatment, but alkaline phosphatase and total bilirubin levels increase. In female mice, fluoxymesterone does increase liver enzymes and alkaline phosphatase levels quite a bit, but total and direct bilirubin remained comparable to baseline. Funnily enough, in untrained male mice, fluoxymesterone treatment improves total cholesterol levels, but it worsened in the other groups. Right? So maybe you don't need to train at all right, to keep your lipid parameters in range. And in the trained male mice, fluoxymesterone treatment improves HDL by one point but it worsened in the other groups. So I would say that fluoxymestrolone has a net negative outcome on your lipid parameters, whether you train or don't train. And although this sounds highly promising, there's also a good amount of scientific evidence that shows that fluoxymestrolone causes liver lesions or other liver complications in dogs. 
And this is why dogs should stick to check drops and horses should stick to equipoise and cows should stick to trembolone. Halo testing is only for humans. So let's have a look at the human studies. Unfortunately, a large amount of the human studies are case reports in already unhealthy subjects. So we're going to omit those because it isn't exactly fair to assess liver complications or liver health in people who already have their liver compromised. So instead of highlighting even more individual studies, I decided to pull all of the healthy subjects together from the case reports, clinical trials, and other forms of controlled studies. So we're not going to be here for another 12 weeks. And I also excluded all studies where other medications were co-administered, like I mentioned in the clinical trial summary, because tamoxifen and all of the other medications which are co-administered might have a negative effect on liver health as well. So all the human studies and case reports combined, a total sample size of 79 men, women, and children, instances of liver and spleen complications, five. That is 6.3%. Treatment duration of fluoxymestrolone was between three months to 10 years, and treatment dosages was 10 milligrams to 30 milligrams. So you see that the duration of fluoxymestrolone is quite long. I mean, 10 years in halotestin, what do you expect is going to happen? And in instances of normal liver function following fluoxymestrolone treatment whenever reported, 47 cases or 93.7%. Treatment duration was between six months to 3.4 years with the treatment dosages of 0.05 milligrams to 0.17 milligrams per kilogram of body weight in children or 10 to 30 milligrams in adults. Um, and when you calculate that for the children, based on average body weight, it would be anywhere between two milligrams to 10 milligrams halotestin per day. Now, the citations are down below. You see that there's actually not so many instances of liver complications in, and this is a big caveat here, in fluoxymestrolone treatment solo, not in combination with other medications, solo for reasonably long durations, six months to 3.4 years. Maybe it's not the fluoxymestrolone. Maybe it's the combination with other medications, right? But let's dive into that a little bit more later on. But to be fair, I did not include one study because I couldn't find the full publication. In this study where peliosis hepatitis was encountered in 12 patients treated with either high-dose oxymetolone or fluoxymestrolone therapy, in three cases, uh, liver failure was the primary cause of death. But because I don't know how many of these patients used oxymetolone or fluoxymestrolone, or if there were any, any other complications prior to these treatments, I did not include this in the sample size. The link is down below. In case you find the full publication, let me know. I would like to include this and then maybe change the percentages of liver complications or no liver complications. I couldn't find anything on liver talks, right? Probably the best book regarding liver health that you could find anywhere linked down below. Uh, there's a small entry about fluoxymestrolone on gene reviews where the author mentioned that long-term therapy causes liver toxicity and hormone replacement therapy in patients with hormone responsive cancers. Right? And hopefully you don't have a hormone responsive cancer, um, which is usually also in the context of receiving tamoxifen treatment. So nothing really tangible in the scientific evidence that fluoxymestrolone by itself causes tremendous liver toxicity unless it's used for longer periods of time. And this lack of evidence isn't because fluoxymestrolone is totally safe for liver health. It's simply because it hasn't been extensively investigated in all of the clinical trials, the human studies, the animal models. In many cases, they don't track the complications on liver health or total cholesterol levels or other lipid parameters. Right? In the HPTA studies, the fertility studies, the short stature studies, cancer studies, they don't track liver parameters or other blood work parameters. So just because it hasn't been studied doesn't mean that halotestin is liver safe. Even though based on the sample size that I was able to find, it appears to be liver safe if used by itself in, well, 94% of the cases. Um, so I went through all of the blood work results that I have of all of the athletes that I've coached over the years, whether those were bodybuilders, strongmen, powerlifters, and even MMA athletes, where I have the blood work results before and after, but not directly after the competition, because we do know that strongmen in powerlifting and even MMA sees a significant change in blood work parameters due to uh, you know, personal bests 
or records being broken or, um, you know, multiple impacts to the body. Bodybuilding is usually dehydration from the use of diuretics, um, but the liver parameters don't really skew that much. So from all of the blood works that I have before halotestin treatment was added on top of a boatload of a polypharmacy, right? We have to take that into consideration. Fluoxymestrolone was not the only drug being used during that time. Before treatment, after treatment, but not right after the competition. And keep in mind that even though polypharmacy is involved, all of these athletes also used a good amount of ancillaries and over-the-counter supplements to sustain their health the best way they could. So we're talking about Tutka, N-acetylcysteine, vitamin E, fiber, injectable glutathione, telmosartan, azetamibe, fish oil, etc., etc., etc. All right, pulling everything together. We have 19 men, all competitive athletes. Total blood work results before and after are 23, right? So some of these athletes went in for blood work during multiple competitions and fluoxymesterone treatment. Uh, treatment dosages were 5 milligrams to 40 milligrams total daily, and the lower end that's MMA fighters, and the higher end that's bodybuilder strongmen and powerlifters. Total steroid dosages being used alongside fluoxymestrolone are anywhere between 150 to 2,500 milligrams weekly. The lower end are the MMA fighters, and the higher end are the bodybuilder strongmen and powerlifters. Polypharmacy compounds being used alongside fluoxymestrolone includes Testosterone, Trembolone, Masterone, Anivar, Winstrol, Superdrol, Anadrol, Aromacin, Femera, Nolvidex, Growth Hormone, IGF-1, LR3, Insulin, Clebuterol, and much, much, much more. Treatment duration is anywhere between two days up to two weeks. I've never recommended anybody to take longer than two weeks, but, <laughs> but there are guys out there who run Floximestrolone for four weeks, right? Not under my guidance. I don't have blood work before and after of a four-week fluoxymestrone treatment, only two weeks. Um, but yeah, it is what it is. People are going to do what people are going to do if they want to win. And the results are as follows, only on liver enzyme parameters. ALT slash SGPT parameters. Before is anywhere between 36 to 85 units per liter. And afterwards, it's 56 to 173 units per liter with a mean 62% increase in these ALT liver enzymes ast sgot liver enzymes before treatment 20 to 80 units per liter and after are 30 to 156 units per liter that's a mean increase of 77 percent and gamma gt levels before is nice and low between 9 to 15 units per liter because of the n acetylcysteine the glycine the injectable glutathione the carnitine and the caffeine being used very good to keep gamma gt levels low but afterwards, it also increases between 15 to 36 units per liter, which is a 35% increase. Now, how much of this is due to training intensity? How much of this is due to oxidative stress? How much of this is because halotestin does potentiate liver toxicity if being used alongside all of the other anabolic energetic steroids and ancillaries and other compounds that these athletes were using leading into the competition? That remains to be debated. And in many of these cases, especially the bodybuilders, the strong men and the powerlifters, they also use Superdrol or Anadrol alongside fluoxymestrolone for the last two weeks leading into the competition because it makes you super full and super strong if you go with Superdrol and Halotestin or Anadrol and Halotestin in combination, right? And of course, this um, increased training intensity that you now have also increases liver enzymes. Now, it is of note that creatine phosphokinase and lactose dehydrogenase levels usually also significantly increase after fluoxymestrolone is introduced at the end of a contest prep. And we all know that uh, CPK and LDH markers are also increased due to training, right? So there's a little bit of an overlap there. And I also went through all of the blood work results after the competition has been concluded, uh, but the results are a little bit all over the place and we have to account for dehydration and you know changes in the overall protocol but a uh, long story short it seems that the liver enzymes are a little bit higher <laughs> than displayed here within one to two weeks after the competition gamma gt cpk and ldh are lower compared to baseline before fluoxymestrone was used but it's probably because training intensity following the competition goes down significantly some guys don't even train for two weeks they kind of need to recuperate from all the strenuous work that they did on competition day whether that's hitting prs or training insane when for all the guys that did bodybuilding shows i mean if you hold your arms out like this 
for an entire hour, I mean, guess how sore your lats are going to be? You don't want to go to the gym afterwards. All right, so we have a good amount of scientific evidence that fluoxymestrolone by itself is apparently not very liver toxic, and a good amount of anecdotal reports um, regurgitated throughout the entire bodybuilding strongman and powerlifting community that halotestin is toxic as sh So who are we to believe now, right? We have the community saying that it's toxic and the scientific evidence saying that it's not really that toxic unless abused for very long periods of time for particular medical conditions. We're going to have to find a middle ground here. And I guess it's highly depending on what you do and how long you take it and what else you take alongside fluoxymestrone. And since I highly doubt that anybody after watching this video is going to run a fluoxymestrone oral only cycle, I would advise you to proceed with caution if you add fluoxymestrone to an existing drug stack because liver toxicity has been well documented in the enhanced fitness community. Uh, let's briefly touch on the detection time while we're at it. I mean, this video is already way too long, so might as well go ahead. The half-life of uh, fluxmestrolone is 9.2 hours. Metabolite in detectable range is over 10 nanograms per milliliter by fluoride anion attachment mass spectrometry. 20 nanograms fluxmestrolone taken orally in a single dose is detectable for over one week, simply because the studies didn't uh, test urine samples a week after the single administration of fluoxymestrolone, and it's the same for 10 milligrams fluoxymestrolone orally in a single administration. It's detectable for over five days. So since urinary metabolite screening hasn't been performed for over one week, I would say that the detection time is actually significantly longer. So I would stick to the reported detection time of two months when you take fluoxymestrolone orally up to 30 milligrams daily, right? And the longer you take it, the longer these metabolites stay in the body. So if you run fluoxymestrolone two weeks, 30 milligrams per day, uh, based on all of the athletes that I helped pass, two months is a safe bet. All right, and fluoxymestrolone is also detectable in human hair in case you're interested. All citations are down below if you want to do more research. Okay, let's move over to the fluoxymestrolone dosing protocols for men. Based on scientific evidence, if you do monotherapy, I would say that the sustainable and tolerable dose is actually similar to the medical insert, five milligrams to 20 milligrams orally daily over two to four divided dosages until blood work parameters become unmanageable. And uh, you probably require 250 IOS to 500 IOS HCG three times weekly to sustain testicular function if and only if you see on your blood work parameters after 12 weeks that luteinizing hormone levels did not come up back to baseline or slightly higher, right? We do know that the scientific evidence shows that total testosterone levels, uh, unless you take ethanol estradiol at the start of the treatment, right? I wouldn't recommend it. Ethanol estradiol makes you feel like that. Um, but if you do do that, a total testosterone and luteinizing hormone might be even higher compared to baseline. One single study performed over 12 weeks shows that luteinizing hormone levels come up higher than baseline. Follicle stimulating hormone levels stay somewhat the same, but total testosterone levels are still suppressed. So if you do your before and after blood work results of a dose uh, of five milligrams to 20 milligrams of fluoxymestrolone daily, and you see in your after blood work results or during the treatment that LH is still suppressed and total testosterone levels are still suppressed, then I would advise you to take some HCG. HCG is not known to have a negative effect on your lipid parameters or your liver parameters or other parameters which are known to be worsened by fluoxymestrolone. And if you're crazy enough or biohacking enough to do a fluoxymestrolone monotherapy protocol, send me your blood work. I would love to see it. I would like to see where your lipid parameters end up and your liver enzymes end up and what happens to your LH, FSH and total testosterone levels, right? The scientific evidence is, um, you know, somewhat for a protocol like this, but I would still advise against it because, well, we have hormone replacement therapy with bioidentical hormones, testosterone, DHA, pregnenolone, and uh, HCG to sustain testicular function, and then feel free to add in growth hormone and Cialis or uh, Telmosartan to kind of round out your hormone replacement therapy protocol, right? We don't have to reinvent the wheel, but if you want to do it, send me your blood work. I would love to see it, honestly. And then the deleterious dose that's mostly for athletes leading into the competition, that's between 20 milligrams to 40 milligrams orally daily. I, again, I wouldn't recommend 40 milligrams daily, but there are guys out there who do that. 
over two to four divided dosages for a maximum of two weeks. Don't do it any longer because blood work parameters, especially liver enzymes and overall aggression levels just get worse and worse and worse by the day. So the maximum effect I would say is already accomplished regarding body composition and strength and overall um, muscularity, hardness, density, etc. What you're after, after using halotestin for two weeks, that's already established after two weeks. And after that, uh, performance doesn't really go up or cosmetic appearance doesn't really go up, but blood work parameters certainly get worse and worse and worse. But if your blood work parameters become unmanageable earlier on, like after a couple days of fluoxymestrone treatment at let's say 40 milligrams per day, you go in for blood work because you feel off and your liver hurts and you can't really eat and everything's f***ed, then stop. <laughs> stop. Just stop. Please. You don't have to continue leading into the contest because the more you take it, the more you're compromising your health. And you might not make it even to the stage. For women, the sustainable and tolerable dose, zero milligrams weekly because it's so virilizing, well-established in scientific literature. Even in cases of uh, Turner syndrome, you see the children experience a good amount of virilization. And if you were to go with the anabolic to androgenic rating, which I've kind of debunked, then you see that those ratings are so high that virilization will surely but steadily set in. So avoid it if you care about your femininity. And the deleterious dose for bodybuilding competitors only or strongman or powerlifting females among us, I would say that five to 20 milligrams orally daily over two to four divided dosages for a maximum of two weeks leading into a contest is doable. But again, if blood work parameters become unmanageable earlier on, stop it, discontinue it, it's not worth it. Please don't overdo it. I understand you want to win, but you don't have to kill yourself or compromise your health for it. And whatever protocol you end up with, make sure you use some ancillaries to keep yourself healthy. Tatka and estylcysteine, vitamin E, fish oil, citrus bergamot, maybe even IP6 to keep your hematocrit levels under control. Um, make sure that you stay as close to the healthy range as possible. You'll probably need azetamibe, you probably need telmasartan, maybe even the bivalol to keep all of those parameters under control. And do your blood work over at Merrick Health, right? If you live in the United States, they're probably against treating yourself with halotestin, but at least they have the blood work available for you so you can look at the results and decide if you want to continue or never run halotestin ever again because all of your blood work parameters are in the red, right? Do the blood work before and after and prove it to yourself if it's sustainable or not. And before we close off this video, since we all know that fluoxymestrolone makes you as angry as it makes you strong, look into methods to control your moods. Because every time I would recommend halotestin to one of my athletes, whether those are bodybuilders, strongmen, or powerlifters, within a couple days, communication is insufferable. Their mood is terrible. They're in a very dark and horrible place. Of course, they want to win. Um, but unless you use something like a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, fluvoxamine, vortioxetine, or something else, or some sort of over-the-counter supplement like L-theanine, saffron extract, glycine, GABA, melatonin, whatever you can get your hands on to take the edge off, or even wheat or kratom and valium, right? I mean, the substance abuse during halo testing at the end of a contest prep, you guys probably don't have any idea. Sometimes hear it after the competition of these athletes that say that, you know, they had to take valium at the end of the night because otherwise they couldn't sleep and they were so angry that uh, they broke all of the plates and the dishes, <laughs> whatever else in the house for the smallest f***ing reason, right? This compound is meant to be respected. And if you're an angry asshole before you add in the fluoxymestrolone, like I am sometimes, just don't do it. It's not worth it. It's, it's not f***ing worth it. Really, it's not f***ing worth it. You will break up with your girlfriend or wife. You will have issues with your partner. You will hate your pets. You will hate the world. You hate everything about yourself and you hate yourself for hating yourself and feeling this way. So again, guys, caution is advised. Respect this compound and only use it, in my opinion, if there's something to win, right? And if you can keep your health intact while using it. Okay, food for thought. The longest video I've ever made on a anabolic androgenic steroids, but hey, this is what you guys wanted to see. So here it is. Thank you guys so much for watching. You can find everything that I'm associated with down below in the YouTube description section. Follow me on Instagram and TikTok at Vigor Steve. Vigor's crew, you guys know what to do. A front double biaser for you guys. No halo testing in the picture here. I mean, I swore off trend and I will probably never use halo testing again because I'm a moody son of a bitch using these compounds and it's not worth it to me. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.